At the end of the last panel, Rick Weisberg asked the, the question, how do we change social, social norms? And that's what this third panel on cultural change is all about. Uh, the panel will be led by moderator Zerlina Maxwell, who's a political analyst, speaker, and writer in print, on the radio, and on Twitter regarding national politics, candidates, specific policy and culture issues, including domestic violence, sexual assault, victim blaming, and gender equality. Uh, she is a real Twitter political voice and has actually had her Twitter feed selected by Time as one of the best in 2014. So I welcome Zerlina to introduce our panel. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, this panel is, uh, I'm very excited about it, uh, particularly because my work around rape culture and uh, ending gender-based violence um, intersects so well uh, with the three panelists we have today. And so I'm really excited to uh, hear from them. Our panel will examine how culture, uh, examine culture and how it pr pr promotes and prevents violence. The term rape culture, which you'll probably hear a lot this afternoon if you haven't already heard it uh, throughout the day, uh, was po first popularized in the book Transforming a Rape Culture, which is a book by Emily Buchwald, uh, which was published in the 1970s. Um, and rape culture essentially is defined as a complex set of beliefs that encourage male sexual aggression and supports violence against women. It is a society where violence is seen as sexy and sexuality as violent. In a rape culture, women perceive a continuum of threatened violence that ranges from sexual remarks to sexual touching to rape itself. A rape culture condones physical and emotional terrorism against women as the norm. In a rape culture, both men and women assume that sexual violence is in inevitable. You've heard phrases like, ah, boys will be boys, or she was asking for it. So dismantling rape culture essentially begins with completely reframing the conversation, which we'll try to do this afternoon, and instead of teaching women how to not get raped and how to avoid rape, we should instead be teaching men to not rape in the first place. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, our three speakers today um, are all experts in different aspects of the ways in which these cultural norms and toxic, toxic masculinity impact epidemic levels of gender-based violence. First up, we have Laura Bates, who is the founder of Everyday Sexism, an international collection of more than 80,000 testimonials of da daily gender inequity. And I love Laura's work because essentially it talks about all of the things that women we ignore, we block it out. It happens so often that we don't even notice it's happening. Catcalling is one example of that, or you know, groping and harassment on public transit is another example. She works closely with politicians, uh, police forces, schools, universities, and businesses, and has addressed organizations from the Council of Europe to the United Nations to tackle gender inequality. Next up, we'll, uh, we'll have Jackson Katz. Um, he's an internationally renowned uh, for his pioneering activism and scholarship on issues of gender and violence. He is the co-founder of the Mentors in Violence Prevention Program at Northeastern University's Center of, for Study of Sport in Society. The Mixed Gender Multiracial MVP Program is one of the most widely imp implemented sexual assault and relationship abuse prevention programs in schools, colleges, sports culture, and the military in North America and beyond. He's written several books, including The Macho Paradox, Why Some Men Hurt Women, and also, most recently, Leading Men Presidential Campaigns and The Politics of Manhood, which I have to read because that sounds particularly interesting. Um, you might be familiar with his work because he did an, a phenomenal TED Talk, um, which has been viewed over two million times. It's called Violence Against Women, It's a Men's Issue. Um, and then lastly, I'm so uh, thrilled to be also joined by Hawa Ibrahim, who is a senior partner in, Air, in the Aries Law Firm. She works as a lead attorney with a team devoted to the cause of human rights for women in Nigeria, certainly something that has been in the news currently. And she has won a number of uh, precedent-setting cases before Islamic Sharia courts. Ibrahim was the 2008 to 2009 Rita E. Hauser Fellow here at the Radcliffe Institute and has also been a visit visiting lecturer on women's studies in Islamic uh, law at the, right here at the Harvard Divinity School. She's also a fellow at the Human Rights Program and Islamic Le Legal Studies Program at Harvard Law School. She's uh, clearly uh, very comfortable here. 
up here in, uh, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And she's also been a World Fellow at Yale, a uh, competitive <laughs> competitor of Harvard. <laughs> so uh, I'm really excited. Each panelist is going to speak um, for approximately 18 minutes, and then we're going to go to a Q&A, um, the same essential format as the other panels uh, that you've seen today. But I'm very excited because uh, you know, while policy and the law and activism are all important in dismantling rape culture and gender, gen, ending gender-based violence, I say that unless you're changing the way that we as individuals interact with each other on a daily basis, you're not going to change much. Um, because once, once you get to the policy, you're at the point where um, it's too late. You got to change the way people are interacting with each other before you can even get into a courtroom. So I'm very interested in uh, the presentations we're going to see this afternoon. So thank you very much. And uh, first up is Laura. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I started the Everyday Sexism Project directly um, to create cultural shift, so cultural shift and the idea of the intersection between culture and violence is really at the centre of this work. Um, I set the project up really directly to confront societal assumptions about gender equality that were at odds with women's lived experience, both on a micro and a macro level. Uh, I started the project um, out of a particularly bad week where, by sheer coincidence, I had several escalating experiences of harassment and assault. And what happened was that at the end of this week, I was sitting down thinking about this awful week I'd had. And what really struck me was that if any one of those things had happened on its own, I never would have thought twice about it because it was normal. I was just used to it. This prompted me to start conversations with other women. And I thought that maybe a few of them would have a story to tell me. What happened in reality was that almost every woman I spoke to had a story. And it wasn't one thing from a few years ago. It was on my way to meet you, this just happened. Most days this happens. And often they were really quite severe. They were women who'd been pursued in public spaces, followed, groped, grabbed. Women in the workplace who talked about their male colleagues taking clients to strip clubs where they weren't able to go and then missing out on those deals. Women who described uh, male colleagues in their workplaces printing out women's pictures when they were coming in for an interview and holding up and rating them out of 10 across the office before they arrived. But just like me, so many of these women made a point of saying to me, if you hadn't asked me, I've, I've never mentioned this to anyone. All these experiences that we were kind of, I think, internalizing and just considering as a normal part of life. But what really prompted me to start the project was what happened when I tried to speak up about the problem. When I tried to say, I think there's something happening here, I think this is sexism, I think this is people being treated differently because of their sex or discriminated against because of their sex, the response was absolute. And the response that I got was, sexism doesn't exist anymore. Women are equal now. There really isn't a problem. And I went away and I looked into that and I kind of interrogated that idea, first on a kind of macro level. And when I looked at the proportion of women in politics, in business, when I looked at crime statistics, everywhere I looked, I realized that the reality really didn't match up with that assumption. Um, and this is the case in the UK, but also here in the US. To give you a kind of snapshot, women hold a fifth or less of seats in Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, out of over 2,300 governors in history, only 35 have ever been women. Women are 20% of architects, 17% of economists, 11% of engineers. 80% of books reviewed in the New York Review of Books in 2012 were by men. 80% of the New York Times notable deaths of 2012 were men. Only 5% of CEOs at Fortune 500 companies are women. Um, they only direct around 5% of the major films every year. They have far fewer speaking parts in major films than men, but are far more likely to take their clothes off. Um, one in five women in the US has experienced rape or attempted rape, and three women every day on average are killed by a current or former partner. So I felt that the reality really didn't match up to that idea that women are equal now and sexism wasn't an issue. But what I wanted to do was to bridge the gap between societal perception that there wasn't a problem any longer and the reality of what women were living through on a daily, daily basis. So I set up a very simple website and I asked people to share their experiences of any kind of gender inequality. Um, I didn't have any funding or any means of raising awareness beyond just posting it on the internet. So I thought that perhaps 40 or 50 people would share their stories. What actually happened took me completely by surprise. 
tens of thousands of entries started to pour in. They came from people all over the world. Suddenly the project was hitting the headlines, it was being reported on in the press, and more and more stories were coming in. We heard from, in the earliest entries, a woman in the city who was told to sit on her boss's lap if she wanted her Christmas bonus, a woman working in a video store who found that her boss would smack her every time she went up the ladder to get fresh stock from the storeroom, a reverend uh, in the Church of England who was constantly being asked if there was a man available to perform the wedding or the funeral ceremony, but that it was nothing personal. A vet who was constantly being told there was a particularly prized racehorse that only the male vets were allowed to tend to. A DJ who said that constant groping and harassment had made her come to dread the job that she'd once loved. And the story started coming in from further afield as well, from a woman in Argentina who tried to ignore four men catcalling her in the street only to find that they screeched to a halt and tried to drag her in. A woman in Mexico who was told by her university professor in a lecture, Caedita, te ves mas bonita, you look prettier when you shut up. A woman in Germany who said that having her crotch and bottom groped was something that happened so frequently she just described it as the norm. 12 and 16 year old sisters who were trying to picnic in a public park in France when a man exposed himself to them and a woman in India who was too afraid to report the man with the erection pressed into her back on the train. And so as these stories came in, we expanded very quickly into new versions of the site in different countries and different languages, each with local ownership, with women there running it and using it within their local communities. And it's now been three years since I started the project, and we've had 100,000 stories come in from people all over the world. And given this enormous amount of data that we have, some really clear and I think very important things have emerged from the entries that we've received, often on the theme of connections. So the first thing is that the project entries have made it so clear that these things, that we like to compartmentalise them, we like to talk about sexism over here and harassment there and the problem with women in the media here and sexual assault and domestic violence, but in reality the stories that we were getting were making it so clear that these things were connected that it was a sliding scale, that it was a spectrum, and that actually by constantly suggesting that it wasn't acceptable to make a fuss about the smaller issues, get over it, learn to get a sense of humour, learn to take a compliment, you might have got the wrong end of the stick, you probably meant it differently. We were sending a message about ways in which it was acceptable to treat women on a minor scale, in little tiny ways, tiny, tiny pinpricks or death by a thousand cuts and that actually that was adding up to a culture in which we were seeing women as second-class citizens, that it wasn't possible to kind of separate these different issues because that's not how life works. People don't walk down the street and we say, OK, in this public space we see women's bodies as public property and it's OK for men to comment on them and shout and rate them out of ten or whatever it is, but when you walk into an office we need you to treat women with respect because actually we're taking gender inequality in the workplace seriously, that that doesn't seem to make sense. And also another connection that came very clearly from the project entries was the connection between people writing in with stories who were clearly experiencing sexism, but also other forms of prejudice. So very early on, it became clear that we were hearing from women who were experiencing, again, not separate compartmentalised forms of prejudice, but things that were interacting and having a cumulative effect. For example, we'd hear from a disabled woman who was told to do a pole dance around her walking stick, from a black woman who was told in a job interview by the interviewer that he found her spicy and exotic, an Asian woman who was walking down the street with her boyfriend when someone shouted a comment at them about mail order brides, trans women who were hounded from public spaces, women who were out with their female partners and found men pursued them asking to watch or join in or saying, I have something that can turn you straight, older women who again and again and again used the word invisible in their project entries. And so again it became clear that these weren't separate compartmentalised problems but issues that were intersecting, that people were intersecting that people were experiencing in a cumulative way and that the solution therefore also had to be intersectional, that we had to look at these things as problems that intersected if we wanted to find a way of fixing them that made sense. And the third kind of connections that came through very clearly from the project entries was between the entries we were hearing from women and those that we were getting from men. Again, it wasn't a case of this is what men are dealing with over here and these are women's issues. In the same week, we'd hear from a girl who'd been refused to be allowed to join in a football game at school and a boy who'd been bullied for wanting to take a subject like art GCSE because it was considered too girly. 
In the same week, we'd hear from a man who had been not only denied when he was asked extra time off for parental leave, but ridiculed in the office for asking for it, and a woman who'd been denied a promotion because she was considered a maternity risk, purely because of her age and marital status, not because she had any plans of having any more children. And so clearly, those weren't people suffering from separate problems, but two sides of the same coin. The same outdated gender stereotypes were having a negative impact on men and women. So from very early on, it became clear that this wasn't a about setting men up against women. It wasn't about suggesting that all men should be vilified or that they were all participating. It was actually something negatively impacting everybody, although substantially more of the incidents did seem to be happening to women. But also, I think perhaps that there was a critical mass of men in the middle who perhaps didn't witness these things happening, wouldn't dream of perpetrating them themselves, and therefore needed to be engaged, and that when they became aware of what was going on, then they could be allies in the fight to change things. And the increasing social media following and coverage that we had meant that very quickly the act of raising awareness, which was all that we initially set out to do, began to provide a platform for previously unheard women's voices. And it became in itself a catalyst for cultural change with the aim of reducing sexual violence and gender inequality. So, for example, it gave us a platform to point out things that were perhaps passing people by because they were so minor, to put side by side these kinds of articles which come from the same newspaper and are the same story, essentially, reporting the promotion of somebody who's an extremely highly qualified business person and yet looking at the different way in which that can be reported. And it was also vital, I think, in terms of examining this sort of thing to look at the crossover between culture and sexual violence. So it provided us a public platform to critique areas where culture might interact with or influence violence. So, for example, perhaps to highlight the often hypocritical media sexualization and objectification of women and girls, titillating and victim-blaming reporting on sexual violence. These articles are all appearing on the same newspaper website on the same day, and you can see the kind of difference between between advocacy on one hand and, and the reality on the other hand. It also gave us a platform to challenge really ingrained victim blaming in our police and justice systems, which is particularly important against the backdrop that between 65% and 80% of rapes and sexual assaults go unreported to police. And I think that's a really classic intersection of culture and violence, the fact that we live in a culture which actively dissuades people from feeling able to come forward and report what has happened to them. That rape culture, as you've heard it explained, and, and this sense of victim blaming is so prolific that it is actively hampering the process of achieving justice. And it also gave us a platform to highlight the way that women's bodies are presented as dehumanized sex objects to sell completely unrelated products from burgers to betting websites. And also the portrayal of women in the public eye through a sexualized male lens, regardless of the reason why they were in the spotlight in the first place. Whether it was because they'd been accused of a crime, this is a prime time TV show having a debate about whether or not you'd have sex with Amanda Knox, um, or whether they were the victims of crime. This is the front page of one of the UK's biggest newspapers the morning after Reva Steenkamp had been shot dead. <coughs> or even if they were politicians. Regardless of the reason why women were in the spotlight, we were able to start highlighting the fact that often the lens through which they were being viewed was very, very different from that for their male peers. And obviously, we're not talking about a direct cause and effect here. We're not suggesting that somebody goes out and sees a particular newspaper article or reads a lads mag or sees online porn or plays an online game and goes out and commits an assault immediately as a direct result. Of course, it's more complex than that. But it's vital, I think, in order to challenge sexual violence that we are starting a public conversation about the very normalized, ingrained, and prolific sexism that creates this idea of women as objects, as consumable items, um, as, as sex objects, and that this can kind of create the sort of fertile ground, if you like, from which perhaps we can question whether these more serious um, issues are springing. We're often told not to make a fuss when we talk about cultural issues, but often we would hear how the same words and phrases that were used against women in an apparently minor setting, being catcalled in the street, came up again in an account that was from a woman who was experiencing domestic abuse in her own home. 
or we would hear a story um, from somebody who was a schoolgirl who said that these very sexualized media images of women were being held up by boys in the corridor as they walked past and used as a comparison point to rate them out of 10. Or we heard how when women did try to ignore these apparently minor issues that we're not supposed to make a fuss about, like being wolf whistled at in the street, they saw them escalate. They saw their refusal to acknowledge that being seen as an insult to somebody's entitlement to their body in that public space, and they were followed home and sexually assaulted on their doorstep. And we can't tackle the issues like the underrepresentation of women in business and politics if we don't also take into account the fact that this is how women in politics are portrayed in the media. We have to look at the impact that might be having on voters' perceptions of them, on their own experiences of that career, on whether young women would ever consider a career in politics in the first place. And I'm speaking here from a perspective of my background, which is a focus in gender and sexual violence, but I think there are really clear parallels here when discussing violence and the impact of these kinds of cultural norms, stereotypes, media, irresponsible reporting on other issues as well, like race and gender identity. And another really big, I think, cultural issue in terms of the impact on people's ideas around violence is the proliferation of online porn, which, whether or not you believe it's a harmful medium in and of itself, at the moment unquestionably reflects a lot of the misogyny within wider society. And what we're seeing in the work that we do in schools with young people is a huge amount of misconceptions growing out of that. So you speak to a 13-year-old girl who says she's seen a video of sex on a mobile phone at school. She doesn't use the word porn. And she says in a project entry to Everyday Sexism, I'm so scared to have sex, I cry nearly every night. Because I saw this video at school and I just didn't realise that when you have sex, the girl has to be hurting and crying. And if that's what you're seeing, and it isn't then supplanted by somebody talking about these issues in the classroom, as we've already discussed today, by another narrative, by discussions about consent and your rights to your own body and healthy relationships and what they might look like, then you can understand how those, might, those other things might become norms and assumptions. I was in a school just a couple of months ago where they'd had a rape case involving a 14-year-old boy, and a teacher had said to him, why didn't you stop when she was crying? And he'd looked straight back at her and said, because it's normal for girls to cry during sex. We had an entry from an 18-year-old young woman who'd had sex with her boyfriend for the first time in a loving relationship and said that halfway through having sex, he suddenly started trying to throttle her. And she said that she panicked and pushed him away, and he broke down in tears of relief and said, is that not what you were expecting? Because of what he'd seen online that had made him think that that was what would be expected of him. And I think that's the strongest argument I've seen for the importance of talking about these issues with young people, even in an incredibly simple way. When I talk at universities with young women and I talk about sexual assault, we talk about the term groping, and they say that it's normal. It's a normal part of life if you're a young woman, this idea of groping, this euphemistic term that has sprung up. When in reality, in UK law, if you're touched on your body by another person, the touching is sexual and you don't consent, it's sexual assault. But when I use those words for it, they crowd round me at the end of the lecture saying, that can't be sexual assault because it's normal. That can't be sexual assault because it's happened to me so many times. We're creating a gulf, I think, between the reality of women's lived experiences and what's actually acceptable, even under the law, even under the policy we already have. And that's why cultural shift, attitudes and behaviours, I think, are so important. So how do we do this? How do we involve people in this kind of battle? Well, for everyday sexism, social media has been hugely important. And it's been about creating innovative ways to really get people involved. So they're not just reading stuff but they're actively involved. This is a really simple example. We had political debates because we're coming up to an election in the UK recently. So we created this political sexism bingo card and it got tweeted thousands and thousands of times and people were playing along during the debate, crossing off what happened. And as you can see at the end of the debate, it was a pretty poor showing and these were the results. Or in the case of our Facebook rape campaign in 2013, we used infographics to send a really clear and punchy message about the situation, which was that at that time, Facebook had huge numbers of pictures, memes, images, groups dedicated to rape, violence against women, glorifying it, um, inciting it, not just a sexist joke, but really incredibly aggressive things. An image of a woman in a pool of blood at the bottom of a flight of stairs with the slogan, next time don't get pregnant, and so on. 
Um, but I think this is a really exciting uh, example of the capacity for social media and the online world to be used to create that social shift that we're looking for, perhaps in a quicker way than we might have got to it before. Because what we did was we created these kinds of messages very, very simply summing up the situation. This was a post, this young girl that had been repeatedly refused by Facebook, refused to take it down during the course of our campaign, and yet another image that showed a woman's breast was banned. And so we got people from all over the world to get involved in just very simply circling the adverts that came up alongside these kinds of images on Facebook and then sending them publicly to the advertisers and saying, um, you know, if you advertise on Facebook and they don't have a policy against gender hate speech, which they didn't at the time, although they did have really good policies on other issues of prejudice, then this is what your ad could come up alongside and how do you feel about that? And working with Suraj Mali, an American feminist and women action in the media here in the US, we managed to get 60,000 people to take part in the campaign and within six days Facebook said we'll change our policies and we'll train our moderators. So I think it's very... <laughs> so I know I'm nearly out of time, but very briefly, I think what's really exciting about that is that there might be a per person on the other side of the world who turns to Facebook to upload a joke and a picture of a woman with a black eye, and they might never have heard of me or women in the action in the media or everyday sexism or even feminism, but Facebook as a structure will send them the message that that's not acceptable. And I think that that's quite exciting in terms of the potential to create this Sorry. using that kind of online activism. But there is a downside. And the downside is that these are the kind of messages that come in. And for me, this started within weeks of starting Everyday Sexism. So before we had any entries or any kind of press interest, and these entries come in sometimes at the rate of up to 200 a day. I don't know anybody working in this area, working online, who hasn't experienced this. And I know I'm not alone. Yeah, I, was like, yeah, that's I know like I'm not alone on this panel yeah. even um, in having experienced it. Um, and also that it can take on other dimensions and is not always focused just on sexism. And I think it's really important to highlight that because we have to tackle this, we have to fix it. If we want young people to be able to take advantage of this really exciting wave of activism that's going on online, then we need to fix the problem that in this area women are unsafe, that girls are being driven out of these conversations. But it isn't all bad news. We are starting to receive very different entries now to everyday sexism. Three years on, 100,000 entries on, we're starting to get messages from people specifically saying that it's opened their eyes, that it's changed their behavior, or that it's made them feel that they have the right to stand up in very personal ways. And what's exciting is that it isn't always about waving a banner or going on a march. It's a woman who was sick of cold callers ringing and asking to speak to the man of the house because she's a single mum, so now she puts them on to her six-year-old son. <laughs> it's a woman in the workplace who was sick of a colleague whenever she disagreed with him saying don't worry about her she's just on her period who just turned around one day and said if I had to bleed to find you annoying I'd be anemic <laughs> It's um, a woman in the workplace, again, who said, I'm an engineer and I'm just sick of being asked to do the photocopying for male colleagues because I'm the only woman in the workplace. It's not, you know, it's not part of my job description. They know I'm an engineer. So she started coming into work 10 minutes early and breaking the printer. Um, a man who was walking down the street and saw two men shouting at women from a building site, shouting, get your tits out. So he lifted up his top and showed them his instead. And these might seem like tiny things, but it's all about culture shift. He was sending the message to those men, you wouldn't do that to me, so why are you doing it to them? And I think that really is what we need now. We need that moment where each individual person, when this crosses their path, has the choice to be the person that looks away or the person that stands up and says something. And I think that it's really exciting that we're at a point where so many people are talking about this. We are seeing hope. Just in the UK, 200 new feminist societies have been set up at schools and universities in the last two years alone. People are talking about this. There's buzz about it online. And it really is something, I think, that, that can happen, that change is happening, and that there are positive possibilities ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it is excellent. When I came back and I saw the room full, 
I was like, oh my God, they are not so tired. It has been such a long day. So you really honor each of us by staying back and you honor us by your just faces and smiles and hopefully interaction subsequently. Dean Cohen, thank you so much uh, for inviting me back home uh, to the Radcliffe family. And I want to say thank you too to all the families, members we have of the Radcliffe here, to my friends, to my brothers and sisters, as Diane would say, uh, and I noticed my sister Anne Browdy, my soul sister, is here. Uh, I want to thank the media uh, and uh, all the support staff that gave us coffee. I just arrived from Amman, Jordan, and I was really sleepy, so thank you for the job that you do for helping us with coffee, all the support staffs, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It feels so good to come back home. Um, in 2008, I came here as a Radcliffe Fellow. And I have an image of the book I wrote, which was conceived in this, in this school, in this institution. And I'll tell you a little bit later about how it has moved on. And part of why I'm in Jordan is because of the book. But thank you for giving me the space, not only to blossom, but a space to have ideas and to have dreams. And the dreams was culminated at the Harvard Divinity School with the help of Anne Browdy and the entire team there. So I want to thank you so much for what you have given me and I hope I'm giving back the world today. Um, I want to say a little bit more about Nigeria and I'm looking at the time. Uh, I come from this beautiful country, Nigeria, and it has about 200 million people now. It's been on the news recently. Uh, for good and not so very good reasons. We have the Boko Haram. I'll mention a bit about Boko Haram in it subsequently. Uh, but more, we have a very credible election, so it makes me proud today to say I'm a Nigerian because of the good thing that had just happened in my country. Um, I started to practice law about 20 years ago, a little bit more than 20, and I started practicing law as a prosecutor. For some of you that have heard my story, I became educated accidentally. I became a lawyer by accident. I guess I came to teach at Harvard by accident. We can talk about that in Q&A. And currently, I'm at the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, I guess also by accident, because I, mean, I was invited by the uh, Crown Prince, um, His Royal Highness Prince Hassan Talal, bin Talal and I have been having a blast the past three, about three months now in Jordan. And I could talk to you a little bit when I speak about this issue of confronting violence and the changing culture to reduce this violence. Um, in, um, I, I brought the book up because I wanted to mention that practicing Sharia currently is being translated into Arabic. I spent the last few months in Amman uh, working with judges, Sharia judges, and Sharia lawyers. And I'm not only working in Amman, because the institute, which is WANA, is West uh, Asia, North Africa uh, constituents. So I've had opportunity to, to interact with people across this region, thanks to Radcliffe. Um, I have had opportunity to visit Zatari. Some people that have known about part of what is happening in the Middle East. Three days ago, I was in Zatari, which is the, concent the camp, not concent the camp for the Syrian. We have over half a million people in Zatari. And I wanted to relate that to this confronting violence because the story is uh, similar as I move across the border. In 2014, Radcliffe granted me an opportunity to come here as a fellow for the summer. Uh, about the same time, the president of Nigeria invited me back to Nigeria to address the issue of the kidnap over 200 girls by Boko Haram. So I went back and I was in between running around from here, roughly back to Nigeria, uh, to be able to work on issues of Boko Haram and the kidnapped girls. Um, so all this put together and my little experience, like I said, in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, I wanted to reflect on some few questions um, based on this topic. And I posed some few questions while I was looking at what to say now. What violence? Violence against whom? 
Why the violence? And how can we confront it? And lastly, what can we do differently, especially from a cultural perspective? I will attempt to answer those questions um, in, my, in my presentation. Now, the cases I have handled of women sentenced to death by stoning under Islamic Sharia in Nigeria since 1999, including the case of Amina Lawal, who was sentenced to die by stoning for having a child out of wedlock, to the case of a young woman called Gulas, uh, Gulnas in uh, Afghanistan, who was forced to marry her rapist. And I don't know for some of you that follow stories recently, there has been a case of a young woman who was going to villages in Afghanistan to help with human rights issues. And she was alleged to have banned the Quran. This was just last month. And she was killed. And to defile traditions, the woman decided to carry her coffin, which is totally out of place. And it's a story on the YouTube, you could look at it. But this, from all these instances, a couple of things has resonated. And I wanted to mention them by passing. Tradition and culture, we have discussed that extensively here. Shame, honor, and death. Religion, media, and the power of language. But how do we confront violence? How do we reduce it? I want to suggest five thoughts, and I'll try to illustrate as much as I have the time to do that. Number one, I think we have you know, bitten the dead horse, but I'll try to still beat it a little bit. The issue of language, and how do we deconstruct language? And let me give you an example um, of how I deconstruct language in my own context. I, I forgot to mention my, my disclaimer. <laughs> which I always will have to do at the beginning, which is that English is my fifth language. <laughs> so if you don't understand what I'm saying, or if I'm too fast, please wave your hand so that I could repeat myself. I want us to, to have a conversation. Uh, I never learned English in a classroom. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is that I may say some few things that is totally out of your context. So remember, I'm speaking from a contextual perspective, which is my work, and I am because my clients are. I am because you are. I am because you are. So look at it from a contextual perspective. And so my, my work has always been um, learning in a way, but also trying to um, speak some few things. So I was, I was in Nigeria and in 2000, and and five, actually before I left the Minister of Justice, I was a prosecutor for eight years. Before I, when I left the Minister of Justice, I started a legal practice. But it was difficult, and we're talking about culture and change. It was difficult for us in the northern part of Nigeria, where I come from, to litigate in court. Litigation and rules we spoke about today and the contextual issue of violence may not be the same in our own situation. So we discovered that if we go to court to seek for relief or for justice, we, we just don't get it. So we identified some opinion leaders. And one of the people we identified was an elderly person who has a huge influence in the society. We call his, call his, his name is Baba Ajia. We call him Ajia, we call him Baba, a son of respect. What we will, achieve, will not normally have achieved in court, we were achieving two, three times more than what we will achieve in court just by using him. And let me tell you some few words he will use when we have challenges. Most of the challenges as of that time is the issue of violence against women. So the issue of wife beating, the issue of inheritance, the issue of divorce and maintenance. And one time one man really hit his wife badly. And then we went to Baba. The man is very influential in the society. And Baba called the man. And he just used one word to summarize him. Sakre. S-A-K-A-R-I-A. Sakre. That settled the matter. That was the last time he beat his wife. He summarizes him in such a way that he was so disgusted, just naming and shaming, that made him to go back and, and just that was the end of it. So it, it depends on our context. 
For us, the use of language and the use of influential people has helped us in some cases, and this is one of the instances. I was in Afghanistan, and there was a workshop on the issue of criminal law and women, and an American was there, and he was saying, the men are cowards. Those who men that beat their wives, they are cowards. And the mullahs, the, mullahs uh, the Taliban and the Mujahideen were looking at him in a such a strange way. How can you dare call us coward? The use of language. Sakare could have solved that problem. But uh, there is a need for us to realize in, even, in each given circumstances that language could be used in a very creative way. Um, we have to try to heal some wound. Some of the wounds are wounds of history based on our own specification. And we have to work within our context. It has been stressed, so I'll just go over it quickly. Religious leaders. Um, there is this concept of theology versus ideology. And I don't want to go into that, but I just mentioned it, theology versus ideology. Some people that think uh, defining God in theology and the ideology like of Boko Haram. And let me use that word of jihad. Some people will have the word jihad and put it in the context of holy war. But remember, there is one context we have theology, learning about our belief in our gods, our God. On the other hand, we have just pure ideology, people that just want to take some few words and discredit a religion that is otherwise peaceful. We have the, I wanted to mention here briefly the issue of um, religious leaders speaking out. And I wanted to say that there has been instances where for sure religious leaders have spoken out. People have called me, why are not those Muslims speaking out against this violence against the women? ISIS, Daesh, Boko Haram. Oh, they have spoken. But have their voices been projected? That is something we have to deal with at some point. But this is part of the media text. Um, you know, I, I was reading the Quran. Of course, I have read the Bible several times and some other books. And I always ask myself this question. These are texts, you know. These are texts. Does text speak? Have you ever thought about whether texts speak? No. We speak to the text. We speak to the text. So if men will tell us what the text is, in terms of moving forward, how can we tell what the text is? The text doesn't speak, we speak. And I hope that as we look for solution, a cultural solution, one of the things we have to consider is interpreting the text that suits our situation as women, especially when we confront violence. Alternative to violence. I mentioned here, I want to mention here the issue of creating safe space. It has been spoken earlier on. How do we create safe space, both for women and for youth? Uh, because a lot of this perpetration of violence by Daesh, by ISIS, by Boko Haram, are youth, young men. And how do we now penetrate them? Now, let me say something here. That the oxygen of a terror is the media. The oxygen of a terrorism or a terror person is the media. Now, when we sniff them out of that oxygen, depends on how we do it. We may slow down these instances of, you know, perpetuating it. And I want to say with respect when I think about the media, and I know, Dean, you know, you do that much better than I do. We need to bring them to the table. They are redefining who we are. I was talking, I was, I was trying to make a, put an article together about this big six. Some of you have known some of the big six are the one defining everything we do, including what we eat, how we live our lives. Bring them to the table. We need to have a conversation. Who are just controlling our children's mind with PlayStation? Rick was speaking earlier on about, about his child and his daughter, son and daughter. Some of us have children that are glued to the PlayStation. You know what they watch? You know what they play? Guns, killing, blood. We need to bring those people to the conversation too. Those people that are helping, you know, take over the minds of our children. Can we do it differently? I'm not saying it's right, I have no judgment, but can we do it differently? Can we start a conversation where we can change this culture of violence from the womb? 
from our children, from those people that are influencing them in the social media, can we do it differently? And I think uh, as we look at cultural changes, now it's a borderless world. Pretty without border, with the internet. The social media has no border. We need to keep them in the conversation as we move on and see seeking for solution. We have to have deliberate policy in Tagestan. Some of you might have known they have banned religious preaching, some of them that are very extremist. So we have to take some action, especially in the policy side, about doing some few things differently. Um, I wanted to also add here the issue of fig versus fiction. The fig is the interpretation of the text, and the fiction is the mind of uh, the terror, whatever they, they, they want to use as their fiction. I also wanted to mention the Qad versus Al-Qaeda. The Al-Qaeda is the, the Qad as in Q-U-D-S, and Al-Qaeda, the Qad as in the holy, the Al-Qaeda as the opposite of the holy. So this has some, some concept of awareness that we need to create. Now, talking about awareness, let me quickly mention here that as we create this culture of awareness, I heard some people spoke about it earlier on. We can say, but the best way is we leave. So don't tell me, show me. Show me. Leave it. For us to make a change, we have to be the agent of that change. I want to mention because of the time here, the issue of the context and the, the localness of it and our experiences. Uh, but let me end up by issue of, I mean, I'll say two more things. The moderation and modernity. Moderation and modernity. We have, we have had languages today and war of words and the explanation what, that, what is violence and you know, the violence, the commentary. Or not. Now, it's excellent. And we go to the villages, some of us, and we tell the women, you have right of equality with men. Oh, you are, you are the woman. You know, you have to right much more than the man. When we do that, we are bringing, some our villages are bringing modernity, which is okay. But the modernity must be tempered with moderation. Otherwise, we ourselves are the perpetuation of a perpetuator of, of violence. Finally, the mothers. <clears throat> The good book says, bring up a child at the way he should go. And when he's old, he will never depart from it. A lot of honors depend on us mothers. I have two boys. And I tell them always, don't do what I say, but do what I do. They don't bring girls in my house. They I know my son is cute. <laughs> and uh, he's six feet two, and uh, he's Italian. Half of me is Italian, so he's a cute guy. <laughs> well, you know what? I have not brought a man to our house, and you don't bring a girl to my house. I am not sure it's right. I'm not, I have no judgment. But I have a line drawn, and I leave it. And for me, I want to encourage mothers and grandmothers train up the child the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Finally, I want to end up with a small story about me and my sojourn with the Boko Haram. I had opportunity, like I said last year, to work on the issue of Boko Haram and the kidnap. And I always remember this issue of messenger and message. Now, when I went to Nigeria, uh, there was uh, economic summit happening somewhere in Abuja, so we were not allowed to, to meet as a group for three, for three days. And this is what I did. So some of you that have been to Africa have something to do with developing countries. The most places you can get some really amazing, interesting information are three. Anybody know about the three places? The market the motor park, where you know, we have motor park, so you have to go to a park to take the vehicle to another place. So the motor park is very important. And the last one is hospital. If you really don't want to know what is happening, really, these are three places you need to consider. 
So I went to these places because I have been away from Nigeria for some time, but I wanted to get to what is happening in reality, not what I read in the papers. But the point I wanted to make is that I don't know what your dynamics are. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know where you, what is your motor park or your market or your hospital where you get information as you look at changing the culture of violence. And to be relevant to whoever we are working for and working with, that whenever we ourselves become an impediment, we must learn to pull back by our actions, by our omissions, we could also be perpetrators of violence. When you know it's time is out, tell yourself time is out. Either you're in a position of responsibility as a head of whatever, when time is out, it's time is out. And I did it as a lawyer. When the attention was focused on me, I knew the moment I continue, I could cost my client much more. So I pulled back. And with the help of the Divinity School and Anne Browdy, the entire dynamic changed because we brought the Sultan here. And we got even a bigger voice. So maybe something higher is calling you somewhere that you'll be an agent of this stopping or slowing down of violence or confronting it. Think about it. It's just you, one person. One day, one issue, one time, with respect to whatever you have done or you are doing, we should be the agent of not perpetuating violence. We should be the agent of change. We should leave the world a better place than we found it. Thank you for your time. Well, I think I have the um, great distinction of being the final panelist on a day of incredible panelists and presentations. And I, this is great. Thank you very much. And I, I appreciate very much the uh, opportunity. So thank you. And I know it's been a long day, even though it's been packed with interesting ideas and people and meeting. And, and here we are at the home stretch so we can breathe. OK. Um, let me say my work and the growing movement of men who are doing work in gender violence prevention and much more in a multi a racial multi ethnic sense here in the states and in a global sense all over the world that growing movement of men that i in a sense represent is um is indebted to the leadership of women of course women have been doing this work women have been the ones putting on the on the front burner both intellectually politically personally and every other way the issues of of gender and violence for centuries now. Uh, and men have been, you know, along the road, we have been part of this conversation, but um, it's, there's a growing movement of men. And there's nowhere near a critical mass yet. We're, we're trying to build a critical mass of men to join with the women who have been the engines of the transformations that have been happening. But we have a long way to go uh, to get to where we need to go uh, in terms of engaging, engaging men. But I think it's always important, and I say this all the time, I think it's always important when men like myself have these kind of opportunities that we acknowledge that our work and our personal growth is indebted to women for that. And I think that's really important as we, as we try to expand the number of men who are engaging with these ideas. So thank you to the organizers, my friend Diane Rosenfeld in particular, but everybody for your uh, advocacy in putting this um, conference together. Um, we need a paradigm shift in our thinking about gender and violence, right? And I'm going to articulate my perspective on that paradigm shift. Some people have gotten to pieces of it through the course of the day, but I'm going to get right, right to the heart of the matter. Um, people hear the word gender and they think it means women. People hear the word race, they think it means it, you know people of color, and like African American people say in the states or other um, other people of color. Uh, people hear the word sexual orientation, they think, tend to think it means gay, lesbian, bisexual. People hear the word gender, they think it means women. In each case, the dominant group doesn't get paid attention to. Um, it's, it's incredible how this works, right? And it's not an accident, it's not sloppy thinking. This is how power works. 
and even the term, I mean, the terminology, the language that we use to even think about and talk about violence is itself needs to be critically examined because it's perpetuating even some of the conversation today, not all, all of it, but even some of the conversation today helps to perpetuate um, the existing uh, power arrangements by leaving unmentioned accountable power. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. I mean, even the term violence against women, you'll never hear me say that. I know Diane referenced it right at the beginning of the day. I never say the term violence against women. It's men's violence against women. Now, of course, there's women's violence against women. There's lesbian battering. There's mother to daughter child abuse. There's female to female, peer to peer harassment, abuse, and violence. But uh, the vast majority of violence in the world is done by men. The overwhelming majority of sexual violence against women is done by men. But you wouldn't even know that from the term violence against women because men are absent from the term. Yeah. I mean, we need to start saying this stuff out loud and loudly. And I appreciate that women are in a more difficult place saying that than men. And I, that's a point of privilege. So I, one, one thing I would say to the men in the room is that we have a greater responsibility than women to say this stuff out loud. Because women can, can often take, well, often do take great risks to just state the obvious, right? I mean, like that men are the ones committing the vast majority of violence, that gender violence is a men's issue, that men are implicated in this, that men need to stand up and speak out. Women who say that run the risk of, in some cases, getting shot in the head, in other cases being ridiculed or being harassed or being socially ostracized on any number of different levels, women taking risks. Men take some risks, but not anywhere near as much. And I think we need more of us to start saying this stuff out loud. So this is really about shifting the paradigm. So violence against women is a men's issue. I mean, it's so basic, isn't it? I mean, I'll give you a handful of other examples of the kind of language that people typically use to talk about some of this subject matter that is itself problematic. We'll ask questions like how many women were raped on college campuses last year rather than how many men raped women or men. We'll say, we'll say things like, in the Boston uh, school system, how many uh, girls were harassed or abused last year, rather than how many boys harassed or abused girls, or how many girls harassed or abused girls. We'll ask questions like, in the state of Massachusetts, how many teenage girls got pregnant last year, rather than how many men and boys impregnated teenage girls. In each case, the use of the passive voice has a very powerful political effect, and the effect is the shift in focus off of the dominant group onto the subordinated group. Again, this is how power functions, and we need to make visible what has been rendered invisible by unaccountable power. And any thoughtful discussion about violence is a discussion about power, ultimately. Who has it, who doesn't have it, and how violence is used instrumentally to either gain or maintain power and control because violence doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's built into systems, and it's an instrumental use that we need to talk about. What is violence being used to do? By the way, on the micro level, in interpersonal relationships, and on the macro level, at the level of states and governments and larger um, systems of power. Because, And again, a sophisticated conversation about violence is a sophisticated conversation about power. And this passive voice piece um, is amazing. I'll give, can I just give you an example ripped from the headlines? Okay, I was flying out here by the way, I'm, from Bo I'm a Bostonian. I'm from Boston. I grew up in Boston. I was born in Boston, Beth Israel Hospital. <laughs> but I do live in California, <laughs> where the only need for umbrellas is to shield ourselves from the sun. Yeah. Sadly, it's a crisis. Right. But when I came here, I mean, it's raining out. And it's like, in California, there'd be a front page story. It's raining. All right. Um, but anyways, in, you know, the. Uh, Sad uh, Boston Marathon bombing uh, trial of uh, Tsarnaev. This is the headline yesterday in USA Today. It says, guilty, now the real question, should he die? And so I immediately thought, no, the real question is, should we kill him? Because that's the real question. But should he die is framing it in a passive way, which shifts the focus onto what's going to perhaps happen to him rather than what we might do to him, which is, how this often plays out in discussions about violence. Using passive voice has a very powerful effect in shifting, like I said, accountability off of individuals or states that enact violence. And that's part of the paradigm shift, don't you think? Uh, <laughs> now, in addition, when we're talking about paradigm shifts, we need to start understanding these issues, not just as men's issues. And by the way, I know that they're also women's issues. Clearly, and women have been the drivers, as I've said, and women are clearly the, uh, the leaders in all of this. But 
I do think that we have to ta start saying out loud that these are men's issues as well. And by the way, people say, well, why do you have to say men and women? Why can't you just say they're human rights issues, they're public health issues, they're community justice issues, they're social justice issues? I mean, I like that, but only to a certain extent because it's degendered. And a lot of men hear social justice. They think women, they, women's issues, human rights, women's issue, uh, you know, community health, uh, women's concern. I think we have to say explicitly these are men's issues. Maybe at some point in the future we won't have to say that but we do now. And it's, this is complicated stuff, because complicated linguistically, because I'm about to do a, a I'm gonna sort of give, give do a bit of a linguistic backflip here, because when, when um, Hillary Clinton identified uh, women's rights as human rights, that was a big step forward in progress in thinking about women's rights globally, but what I've just said is critiquing that as well. So yes, women's rights are human rights, but as long as we use the word in the degendered language, human rights, hate crime, uh, community you know, and public health problem, it, men are still gonna be disenfranchised from that conversation and not held accountable. So I think we have to say it out loud. But in addition to the paradigm shift of saying that these are men's issues, and by the way, men of all class, race, ethnicity, geography, education level, global, local, everything. I mean, it's complicated and complex, the intersectionality piece, but men more generally are still the, you know, in power, if you will, and men are ab abusing women both um, on, a, on a small scale and a large scale in every culture in the world, uh, right? Yeah. So, it's, so it's, you know, there's, there's a reason to call it a men's issue and using that term men, knowing that there's a cl complexities within the category. Uh, but in addition to that paradigm shift, we need to see these issues as leadership issues for men. These are leadership issues for men. And this is one of the things that I've been saying for decades now in my work and my colleagues' work. These are not just men's issues, they're leadership issues for men. What does that mean? I'll give you a couple examples of what it means. If you're a man and you're in a position of leadership, however you define that, whether it's in your family, in your faith community, in, your, in business, in labor unions, in politics, in sports, in media, in education, by definition of that leadership, you need to be educated about the issues of gender and violence and gendered violence. Um, and then you need to figure out what you can do to use your sphere of influence to make it so that it doesn't happen. Not because you're a nice guy helping out the women, but because you're a leader and we expect that of our leaders. We're not even close to that place right now. We're still at the place where we think a guy is such a great guy, he's helping out, he's coming to this conference. There's a guy here, thank you for being here. And I know Michael Kimmel has a that. phrase that he calls premature congratulation. Yeah. <laughs> for men who do this kind of work. And let me just say, I appreciate being appreciated, okay? I understand it's nice to hear, and a lot of the men in this room are probably some of the men who do hear from women. Thank you so much, we do appreciate it. And again, I'm not gonna deny that it's, you know, it's gratifying. But we can't, that's not where we need to stop. We need to, we need to get to the place where it's expected that men are in these rooms. It's expected that 50% of the men at domestic violence conferences and sexual assault conferences and everything related, are 50% of the people there are men. And I'm using the, the, the binary men and women. I appreciate that the gender is more fluid than the binary suggests, and I appreciate that. But it, it, the point is, we need more men in these rooms, and we need to start holding accountable systems and men who are in positions of institutional leadership for not just what they're doing, but what they're not doing because there's a lot of not doing out there in, in powerful male culture, isn't there? So this is a leadership issue, and, and framing it that way is a positive challenge as well, because you're not just saying, you know, you better stop doing these bad things. We're saying, we need leaders to start taking this stuff on, and, and that's a positive frame, and I know Rick was talking about the difference between, you know, empathy and, um, and courage, and again, this is my work and others' work have been talking about this for years, because it is about, in a lot of cases, it is about courage. Men to challenge other men and interrupt other men's sexism takes a certain degree of, of strength and self-confidence because there are so many mechanisms in male peer cultures that are actively policing men into conformist silence. And I'm saying men, forget about boys, okay? Boys are totally policed into conformist silence by some of the dynamics in their peer cultures and the media culture, but adult men are also policed into conformist silence. And we need to break adult men's conformist silence before we expect boys to take those kind of risks. And, and so, you know, as I've gotten older, I've said this more with more authority than I even said it when I was a young guy. We need more adult men with institutional, cultural, and political power to take these risks and stand with women as our partners and allies, not as our antagonists in some fictional battle between the sexes. This is nonsense. Now, um, one, um, one thing that men who are in positions of leadership and women 
I mean, I'm focusing on the men, but need to, to do is make connections between the various kinds of violence. So when I first heard about the subject matter of this conference, I was trying to read through the lines like, okay, there's gonna be a special focus on gender. What does that mean? And, then, and what is the subtext of that? Because a lot of people think when there's a subtext of gender that it's gonna be about what people understand as gendered violence, like sexual assault, uh, domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera. I see almost all violence as gendered. In fact, I think all violence is gendered. I think all violence is gender violence. Um, men on men violence is gendered violence, right? Of course, men on women is gendered violence. But all these interconnections between types of violence needs to be part of this conversation, don't you think? Confronting violence means that we have to start talking about these interconnections. Um, so people in positions of leadership need to know this. So for example, I'll just give you a handful of examples of the connections that I'm talking about. You can't have a serious conversation about domestic violence um, without talking about its connection to a whole range of other things like gang violence. Or you can't talk about gang violence without talking about domestic violence. You can't talk about um, sexual assault without talking about alcohol and substance abuse. That's a, that, by the way, that's not necessarily a form of violence, but it's, these are interconnected with social problems and social realities. HIV, the transmission of HIV, a huge percentage of HIV transmission in the world comes from men's sexually coercive behaviors. For example, having, having uh, unprotected sex with a prostituted person against that, I mean, against that person's will, which is an act of abuse in and of itself, and then having unprotected sex, men having unprotected sex with their wives or partners without, um, you, you know, without even telling them that they've had unprotected sex with potentially people who might have had um, HIV. How can you talk about HIV transmission and not talk about masculinity and power? I mean, it's silly. And homelessness? I mean, fi over 50% of homeless women and children are fleeing abuse. Yeah. How can you talk about homelessness without talking about domestic violence? In other words, people who are in positions of institutional leadership need to make all these kind of connections. And when I say alcohol and drug abuse, by the way, we know that perpetrators and victims are much more likely to self-medicate, much more likely to self-medicate through alcohol, drugs, food, workaholism, all kinds of other uh, coping mechanisms. So that's gonna be part of the conversation too. And people who are leaders need to know all this, a lot of them don't know this. And by the way, in cities across the country, and I've worked in many cities across the country, you have people working on gang violence on one side, and you have people working in you know, domestic and sexual violence, they don't even know each other. They haven't even been to a meeting. There's sometimes class and race tensions around some of this work, but they need to be coming together. And in the 21st century, we need to make those kind of connections, and good leaders do that kind of thing, and bring people together and start seeing the overlap. And by the way, the overlap is, Masculinities. The, the overlap is men are committing the vast majority of this violence. And I, can't, I cannot fa fail to mention, as I came here to do my, you know, por por portion of this, of this panel, I mean, every day, by the way, in the news, it's like, it's like just, just new I events that happen that just confirm this thesis. But I just have to say a, a handful of them. Yesterday was the 150th anniversary of the, uh, the, the Grant Lee agreement to end the Civil War in the United States. Right? Next month, this will be the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. You have the Boston Marathon, um, tri the trial of the Boston Marathon uh, bomber. This, by the way, that's all, to me, that's all about masculinity, the, the Sarnia brothers. The, the, the subtext of the whole discussion is about young men's masculinity and violence and the relationship between violence and the performance of masculinity. Mm -hmm. um, you have the uh, German Wings pilot the other week, uh, uh, you know, who killed 104, if what we now know is is the case, killed 149 people as he took his own life. How many women, by the way, pilots have done that? Does anybody know? Probably zero. Z zero, in other words, zero. but the subtext, it's a subtext, it's not a conversation. People talk about mental illness. By the way, mental illness is, a, is an incredibly important issue. Depression is an incredibly important issue. But why is zero women have done this? School shootings, by the way, schools, there was just another shooting last night, I didn't even see the details, at the uh, census, did you hear about this? Last night, you have to see the news. I don't really, I haven't seen the news today. But the point is, there was a shooting last night, and I think it was in D.C. And I'm not sure if there were multiple victims. I don't know. Anyways, the point is, school shootings discourse has typically degendered. People talk about kids killing kids. What's going on with our youth? What's going on with our young people? And does anybody know how many school shootings have been done over the past uh, 15, 16 years by girls? One non-fatal shooting in Pennsylvania, yet the mainstream conversation is all about kids killing kids. Imagine if girls committed 99% of school shootings. The, the mainstream conversation would be about um, gender, wouldn't it? Yeah. And by the way, how many officer-involved shootings of unarmed suspects have been perpetrated by women? Does anybody know? 
it's again an unspoken subtext. I mean, we have, this, is, this is part of what or intersectionality would, would suggest. We need to talk about the con connections between and among these issues, but one of the connecting points, as I've been saying, is the gender of the perpetrators. The gender of the victims can be women, they could be men, but the perpetrators are overwhelmingly men, and that's not coincidental. And by the way, we can talk about men as victims. Let's talk about men as victims. Men are victims of violence in enormous numbers. Murder, assault, aggravated assault, uh, attempted murder, all these crimes, bullying, gay bashing, men are the primary victims of all these crimes, but they're also the primary perpetrators. So when we talk about men, including men as victims, that's an important part of the conversation, but we can't leave out that men are also the perpetrators. So one of the points that men and women have in common is that we're both the victims of um, men's violence. One last piece and then I'll, then I'll stop. Um, this is a point of personal frustration for me, and you might hear this, this in my voice, but I was, you know, I created the MVP program, Mentors in Violence Prevention, when I was a grad student at the Harvard Grad School of Education, by the way. Um, it, I created it at the Northeastern University Center for the Study of Sport and Society. The idea was to use sports culture as a positive platform to get more men to speak out about these issues. It wasn't about the problem in athletics of men assaulting women, although there is and was a problem of men in athletics assaulting women. It was about the leadership platform that athletics plays and the catalytic role that it could play in the larger culture. That was the idea. So we created this, this the approach called the bystander approach. And by the way, it was based on the work of uh, Ron Slaby and others at the Harvard Graduate School of Education at the time who was looking at approaches to middle school bullying prevention that moved beyond the perpetrator victim binary and, and, and moved into the peer culture and, and talked to kids around the kid doing the bullying and around the kid experiencing the bullying to get people to challenge and interrupt the bullying behavior, to get kids to support the victim and the target of the bullying. In other words, everybody in the peer culture has a role to play. And we took that, we imported that approach into the domestic and sexual violence field with the creation of the MVP program back in the early 90s. And um, we thought, yes, this is a really promising approach, and it, and it is and was. Let me just say, over the last 10 years or so, a number of other initiatives around the country have grown up, taking some of the central ideas of the MVP model and the bystander approach, which, by the way, were rooted in social justice teaching that if you're a member of a dominant group and you don't interrupt and challenge other members of that group when they're enacting privilege irresponsibly or illegitimately, then your silence is a form of consent and complicity. So we, were, that's, we, we had this, like white people need to challenge other white people's racism or you're being complicit in racism. Heterosexual people, same thing. Men, same thing. And it was along a spectrum, by the way. It was challenging men to not just when they're at the point of attack, assaulting a woman or another man, that you need to intervene. It's that you need to have a sensibility that's your responsibility at all levels. The most microaggression, the most the smallest microaggression or sexist comment. If you don't let it, if you just let it go and you don't challenge it, then in a sense you're supporting it. Like Robert's Rules of Order, without objection, so ordered. Well, if you don't object, then you're letting the motion pass, right? So that was the goal of the, of the sort of the bystander approach. As it was understood by me and us in MVP, over the last 10 years, all these uh, several initiatives have grown up around the country that are using the term bystander intervention, depoliticized and emptied of its social justice foundation. And it really is focusing on the point of attack. We need to stop the rape. When we see a rape, it's almost like an, a, a bouncer, like it's like an, a, a glorified bouncer at a party, or you see something, you gotta jump in and stop it from happening, as opposed to a sensibility that's much broader than that, which is, in, in my opinion, the, the most effective way to use the bystander work. And I would say those, are, those people who are working on college campuses, and I know some people in this room have used bystander approach, and others perhaps haven't. Is that, is that we have this moment because of all this political pressure on administrations and in the US military, which I appreciate General Grosso's leadership, we need, we need so much strong leadership at the top from the US, in the US DOD on these issues. Um, if if, if we, ha we have this moment, we have this possibility, we have this opportunity because of all these empowered survivors and because of all this federal uh, government coercion, I just hope that we don't lose that opportunity by watering it down and trying not to say what's the, what's the 800 pound you know, gorilla in the room, which is talking honestly about gender. I mean, because that's what's happening. A lot of bystander intervention programs don't even talk about gender. They just talk about this you know, sort of de-gendered bystander subject, as if there's such a person in the world as a bystander, not men and women and boys and girls who live in, pure, in racially and religiously complex uh, peer cultures that re reside in those peer cultures and are policed into conformity with certain norms in those peer cultures. So I hope, I hope going forward that we can bring back 
the sort of social justice heart of this approach and the honesty that needs to happen. And, and I'll say, I'll end on a hopeful note. I and my colleagues have been working with men and women, because MVP is mixed gender, but we have single gender break breakouts. We've been working with men in the heart of male culture, in the sports culture, in the US military. We're the first gender violence prevention program system-wide in the United States military. Um, for decades now, and I know that some men will come into conversations defensive. They'll come in like, oh, this is going to be another male bashing session. But they don't leave like that because most men can handle an honest conversation. They don't, not have to agree with everything that they hear, but they can have an honest conversation. Most men know that the, the status quo is messed up. Most guys do know that they're not happy. Most guys do know that they're often silent and feeling uncomfortable about the behavior of others. Most guys are good people who are you know, struggling, trying to be good people, both in their relation with women and in relation with other men. And the responsibility of initiating the conversations that young men have to have is not on them themselves. It's on those of us who are, you know, not just parents, and Rick was saying parents, parents, yes, but institutions that have the, uh, the mandate to reduce violence, we also have the opportunity to engage a lot more men and boys, as well as women and girls in these conversations. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna uh, go through uh, questions with the panelists, and then obviously, like the other panels, um, earlier in the day, there's also an opportunity if you want to start lining up um, at the mic in the center of the room for the Q&A with uh, the audience involvement. Uh, my first question is for Laura. Um, I just keep thinking about um, the mainstream media and how I also mentioned the big six, um, because I think of the media as not only um, setting sort of our cultural norms, but also reflecting back what th those cultural norms are. Um, and most recently, sort of uh, in, in the conversation of uh, sexual violence in the media, Fifty Shades of Grey obviously is uh, prominent in that conversation. Um, and I look at movies and culture as sort of an entry point to begin these sort of difficult and more complicated conversations about everyday sexism. So what are some of the ways uh, that we can begin those conversations, maybe using an entry point like Fifty Shades of Grey or Blurred Lines, that Robin Thicke horrible song, um, to, to, to try to shift sort of what people's perceptions of um, gendered violence and how to prevent that violence? Um, I think that's a really great question because it's such a, as you say, such a kind of a universal reference point. Yeah. So it's so easy in a room like this, I think, to forget that you know, there are so many people, the vast majority of people, who will never have considered these things. And what we desperately need, particularly when we talk about shifting culture, is to get people to think differently about something that they've always just accepted because it's normal. And I think those kind of universal things like songs or like uh, films are such a good way to do that. Um, so I think that there are some really great examples of, of women and activists who are doing it. Um, the first really cool example is um, with the Blurred Line song, that there were actually multiple groups of women who created their own parody versions of that song. And they put them online, and it was actually only when you saw the reversal of the situation that if you hadn't considered it, it helped you to recognize this is ridiculous. This is a ridiculous idea. And I think that way of switching things out is really, really clever. That there are ways that we can use very kind of creative activism actually to disrupt social norms. Um, another really great example is when there was a front cover of a magazine and it was a photo shoot of all the women from a particular cast. I think it was perhaps Mad Men. Um, but I'm not sure. And, and they were all kind of posed, um, I think they were all kind of covering themselves with their artfully arranged limbs but not wearing very much at all. And they were all kind of looking a little bit nervous, a little bit scared, a bit pouty. Um, and a group of guys, I'm not sure if it was actually the men from the same cast or a different group of guys, but they recreated this pose, this magazine cover, and it looked ridiculous with these guys all kind of like draped all over each other and kind of going like, oh. And it was, that was what it took to put those two yeah. things side by side. And I think that's a really good um, way of kind of disrupting that. Or another great example is a brilliant feminist called Talat Yaakob in the UK. And she recently wrote this amazing blog that took um, the new Megan Trainor song, um, which is Dear Future Husband, which includes a number of kind of quite stereotypical ideas about what a relationship might look like. And she said, this was so frustrating to me because my nieces love this song. Like they're obsessed with her, they love her. So she decided, instead of reacting against it by kind of saying, this is bad, this is awful, what she did was she wrote a version of it that was the same, but she just added like a really quick postscript to each line. 
So there are bits that say, you know, for example, if it said something like, dear future husband, you know, you, I want you to buy me flowers every day and take me out on dates, she would add, and sometimes I'll buy stuff for you and we can split the bill because I'm going to be earning my own money as well. <laughs> and like, it was a really clever way. And I think using humor like that, you know, using those things as starting points is a really powerful thing. And what we've seen in the UK is that around issues like blurred lines and also around those media things like page three, which was a picture in our biggest newspaper of a naked woman um, every day on the third page, students have been organizing around this and they've been saying, do you know what? Okay, this isn't about censorship. It's not about stopping stuff from happening, but it's about exercising our voice and our rights to respond to that stuff. And if it's going to be there every day in the newspaper, we're going to talk about it every day. And they started campaigns and there were about 30 college campuses in the UK where they actually banned blurred lines by a democratic vote. They decided like we're choosing, we're, we're not going to listen to this and it's out there and people can, but we're not going to have it playing in our student unions. And I think there is such a great opportunity to use those universal things as a starting point to get people into the discussion like a kind of gateway. Yeah. Because I think that, norm, you know, we generally have a hesitation because these right. topics are difficult to talk about. And so I love using pop culture as an entry point because everybody knows, yeah. you know, what Fifty Shades is. Um, for how I, I, I just, I, I continually think um, when we're talking about violence um, abroad, oftentimes you'll hear people in the United States say things like, oh, but women in America, they have it so much better than X country. Um, you know, we should stop complaining and focus on violence in, you know, Nigeria or elsewhere. Um, what, what are ways in which violence is different or the same in, in Nigeria or elsewhere um, as it is in the United States? When I was growing up, I, have, I, I was growing up with my grandmother and grandfather. There was no issue of violence in my village in terms of a man hitting his wife, you know. Now, there was one incident that there was the gossip that somebody has hit his wife, and they sang a song in the small village square. We are about 2,000 in the village. And uh, that was sort of the end of it, naming and shaming. Uh, but let me say this, that there is a power in the woman. And we need to realize where the power is. At times, uh, it could be, uh, it's contextual. But let me tell you, my grandmother was more powerful than my grandfather. She was without a doubt. Now, when my grandfather, they call my grandfather father, but they call him Baba. So he has three wives. The wives call him their father. But the real power in the house was his first wife. So it depends on your context. Where does your power lie and how do you use it? And so when you think about a culture of, uh, of violence in, uh, I say at times we, we, we become timid, you know, but we have a power inside of us. We do, we have the power of the womb. We give birth to all these children, the ISIS, the Boko Haram, the Daesh, they are our children. It's how do we now bring them up in the way they should go? And I think we have to use the power of the womb on one hand, but there is a different way of looking at the power dynamics on one hand and violence in different culture. The lady from India and the lady from Philippines had expressly, you know, in their own examples, told us what, how it's done differently in their cultures. Uh, what is different from what is in the United States, and let me tell you something about the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. I thought I knew something until I arrived there. The women are not only powerful, they are educationally extremely savvy. And so it is, we sit in our own small space and think we know so much until we are humbled by the time we meet some of them elsewhere. So there are issues of violence globally, without a doubt. But I think instead of us crying over spilled milk, it's for us to use the power inside of us to make that change happen and happen now. Just like the team of this International Women's Day this year, let her happen, let the woman happen. And I hope we can make her happen. Thank you. Um, and Jackson, I want to ask you specifically about the NFL. I, I mean, like, I'm so happy we're on a panel because I probably wanted to ask this question since um, the Ray Rice uh, 
controversy, let's just call it that, um, happened. Um, and there was a response from the NFL. Um, and I wanted, I wanted to sort of get your ideas on whether you thought the response and sort of the campaign that they did with No More was sufficient. Um, and if not, what would an, that ideal campaign to end violence by an institution like the NFL, which essentially is the most masculine you know, institution in the country, what would an ideal campaign to end violence look like? I mean, I know that's a big question. No, no. But, you know, I'm only going to get one chance to ask it, and I've been thinking it for a while. So. Uh, thank you. I do appreciate the question. Um, and I'll try to be concise, because I know there's yeah. lots of folks wanting to ask questions. Um, I think the NFL response has been totally inadequate, and a, a fraction of what they could do mm -hmm. with their cultural power and money, it's totally inadequate. And I think we have, I mean, it's not because we don't, there's not enough ideas out there. Right. It's not because there's not enough... Uh, you know, experience working in that space. It's a question of leadership mm -hmm. and uh, and and lack of leadership. Can I just give you an example of of a, of a, of a sports organization that's doing it in a different way? Um, I and my colleagues have been working with um, a, a partnership between the British Columbia Lions, that's the professional football team in the Canadian Football League, based in Vancouver, British Columbia, and and the Ending Violence Association of British Columbia, mm -hmm. Columbia, which is called EVA BC. They represent the sexual and domestic violence programs throughout the province in this partnership where the BC Lions, we trained, my colleagues and I trained a bunch of BC Lions players. They've been doing public service announcements. This is now four years. We've been doing this for four years with the BC Lions. They did public service announcements that have gotten over 120 million views in a province of four million people on TV ads and radio and billboards with, and social media with um, players from the uh, Canadian Football League basically saying to the camera, you know, Men need to stand up and challenge other men when they're being sexist. We need to stand with women, not against them. In addition, BC Lions players have been going out. They've reached over something like 62,000 students directly in high school assemblies, leveraging their power of the brand of, you know, the BC Lions are coming to talk. And they're not experts. They don't claim to be experts on the subject matter. But they do claim to be men. They are men who say, you know, this is important that we engage with these issues. And as a result, and this is the, the people who are running EVA BC said it's the most successful campaign they've ever had because they're getting increased donations, increased political support for the battered women's programs and the rape crisis centers throughout the province. All of this NFL teams could be doing. Right. Can I just give you one other example? And with, with a lot more money than the, than the, um, than the uh, Canadian Football League franchises have. Can I give you one other example of what the NFL could be doing? And I appreciate the opportunity to say it publicly because it's so frustrating that we've, many of us have had ideas for years, but they ha we haven't had the power to enact them. Imagine if every year, and by the way, we were the first, my program was the first program to work in the NFL. We worked with the Patriots starting in 1999. Wow. 1999 is 16 years ago. I mean, it wasn't like we hadn't thought of these ideas about working right. successfully with pro football. <laughs> right. But imagine if every year, every pro football franchise had a day at the stadium, like Gillette Stadium or any uh, of the other stadiums around the league, where high school football coaches would come to the stadium and go through a one-day training on the role of co high school football coaches mm -hmm. in being leaders of young men in anti-sexist, in anti-violence work and you know, gender violence prevention work. Because it's the glamour of the Patriots, for example, or the New York Jets, or whatever it is, right? It's the glamour of coming to the stadium, maybe the coach, maybe a couple of high-profile players are part of it. You have domestic violence and sexual assault advocates and others who are going to be part of that training as well. But the whole focus is on the role of the high school football coach. Because my work with professional and elite athletics has always been about the role that they play in youth sports and high school sports. It's never about like, are we gonna, are we gonna have 90 minutes and we're gonna change these elite athletes' behavior? No, but can we leverage the brand and the power of the modeling that the professional sports can do with Pop Warner coaches and, and high school football coaches and b baseball and hockey? That's the real power of working with the elite athletics is the, is the, is the, is the, is the, is the youth sports piece. And it hasn't happened much at all and it needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I have another a, a question for Laura, specifically about um, the bingo, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the sexism bingo game, because I think uh, starting on Sunday, when Hillary Clinton announces she's running for president, um, that might come in handy over the oh, next yeah. uh, year or so. <laughs> um, and, I, and I'm sort of curious, um, you know, as a consumer of 
the media and political media and we're going to go through a presidential campaign where we're going to be using that card and we're going to be seeing everyday sexism happen, um, not only to Hillary Clinton, but also other women running for political office. And so as someone who is engaged in these issues, as everyone here is, how can we um, in our everyday sort of interactions, when we see a headline on a newspaper or you know see them talking about Hillary's pantsuits on the news, um, what are ways in which we can begin those conversations with our peer groups mm -hmm. um, to point out that that's sexist, you know, like it's almost like that moment where you point and you go, that's that's racist or that's sexist, you know. Yeah. How can we begin those conversations? Well, I think that a really good starting point is this kind of material. Yeah. So using something like the bingo card, something that kind of is a sort of spark for mm -hmm. conversations and that there's a lot of that stuff that's going to be on social media, that's going to be mm -hmm. shared online. Sharing those kinds of things can be a great way to start talking about it. But I think for me, the, the massive thing is it is so hard to be the one person, mm -hmm. right? In all of these issues, whether it's you're being dis discrimination in the workplace, whether it's bullying in school, whether it's starting the conversation about about political sexism amongst your peer group. Mm -hmm. So much of all of this stuff comes back to assumptions about what's kind of the norm, about what's cool. So, so much of feminists speaking up and being silenced and shouted down, for example, comes from the idea of complicity, the idea of banter. That's why this word banter has become so huge, because of the idea that everyone else is in on the joke, and that means that you don't have a sense of humor, and you're the one that doesn't get it, and it's embarrassing, and it's isolating, and it's an incredibly effective mechanism for shutting people down. And it also makes it very difficult to start those conversations conversations to be the one that stands up but it's so much easier if even one other people if even one other person is out there talking about it with you so I think my biggest piece of advice for those kinds of situations is to start these things together um, to make it a group of people starting a conversation or if you hear someone else starting it to jump right in and support them and say yes I agree and I want to talk about it too because so many of these issues I think are so much easier to talk about if there's at least one other person in the workplace if you want to stand up to this stuff we're terrified of being marked out as a troublemaker seen as rocking the boat the potential for our career but as soon as one other person stands up and says I've noticed that too it's immediately not about you it's about the problem it's about the culture it's it's not you making it up or making a fuss or all of those things that we've heard about overreacting actually if 10 of you are saying it, it can't be an overreaction or the wrong end of the stick it's a problem and we can talk about it so I think that's my my big idea for starting those conversations that we do it together that we jump in, that we support one another, and that that goes for everybody, not just for women. Thank you. Sure. Eve Sullivan, I'm a parenting educator, and I'd like to uh, let you know, Jackson, that the NFL has not responded to my frequent letters and proposals to include <laughs> parenting education in player development. Maybe you can introduce me to somebody there? <laughs> Maybe. Um, sure. I'd like to thank my sister Hawa for mentioning parenting education because I am a grandma <laughs> and I do believe that we have a boy problem and we have a not a child abuse problem taking a, a lesson from you Jackson we have a parents abuse of children problem <laughs> parents and caregivers so I'd like a comment perhaps from you Laura or from anyone on the role of parenting education and getting parents in the door to take parenting education, normalizing parenting education mm -hmm. as a role, as a response and an effective way to confront violence. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's hugely effective and there's such potential there that's, that's untapped. I think for me, the reason why I focus so much on schools and the importance of education in schools is because it's a, it's a catch-all, it's a safety net. Um, and I think that parenting education and encouraging parents to speak to young people about this is, is vital and hugely important, but we can't guarantee that they will. We know that a lot of parents say that they feel uncomfortable talking about these issues, that they don't know how to start. And while I definitely agree that we should be having programs to kind of help with that on a logistical and sort of realistic level what we can definitely do is speak to every child and we know that there are hundreds of thousands of kids who are growing up in households where they're already witnessing domestic abuse whether they're experiencing it personally or witnessing it we desperately need a conversation that also takes into account the fact that not every parent will be speaking to their child about it so I think for me that's why I focus so much on school and people often ask well what about parents but I think that with parents it is so much 
about all of us taking on the role of speaking to younger people about this. It doesn't just have to be a parent, right? It doesn't just have to be about educating your own child. It can be talking to nieces and nephews and um, family friends and kids that you're interacting with in learning environments or kids that you're interacting with in whether it's a religious environment or whatever it is. I think it perhaps would be helpful to widen the conversation and to think of all of us having a responsibility to talk to the younger generation, not just to talk to girls about dangers and taking precautions, but actually to say you can do whatever you want and go wherever you want and dress however you want and let's have a conversation with everybody, but particularly as well with boys about how they should be behaving and what is and isn't acceptable. Can I, can I just quickly add, thank mm -hmm. you. There's a growing movement of men globally to engage fathers in the lives of their children. And uh, Promundo, it's a Brazilian-based Brazilian NGO, has been at the forefront of that particular campaign. And it's very promising because speaking to men as our role, many of us who are fathers, is a powerful way to get men into the conversation. Mm -hmm. We also know from at least a decade of research, and perhaps more, that adult men, one of the things that adult men will ag ag almost across the board agree to do in terms of intervening around sexism and misogyny and men's violence is work with young people. I mean, adult men are much less likely to challenge and interrupt each other because of their own you know, status anxiety or whatever issues, but they're much more likely to be responsive to the idea that we have a responsibility to children, because we do have a responsibility to children, both girls and boys, mm -hmm. and we need a whole lot more adult men who are both emotionally involved with their children, but also helping their sons as well as their daughters navigate some of these tricky, um, you know, some of this tricky social terrain in a, in a culture where you know, men's violence against women is so, has been so normalized. I just want to add that um, I, I have those two boys and I was brought up in a different culture altogether, so it's not the same culture. Uh, but I was brought up to be hardworking, to be honest, and to be truthful. And so these are the values I try to inculcate in my children. Now, in practical reality, there are times that, you know, I was brought up, uh, you know, that we have washing machine in the house, huh? but at the age of four, they have to learn how to wash their socks with their hands. Now, I was training them to think there may not be washing machine if they find themselves in another world. So it depends on what is your priorities. For me, I wanted them to be grounded, okay? And to be grounded, I wanted to show them my own values. So I, I bring them to conferences like this when they were young. I wanted them to know what are sensitive to women. You don't use some words in my house. You don't. There are words you are not allowed to use. Any derogating word for a woman, oh, you don't use it. So it depends on what values or, or character or what you want to engrave in your sons or grandchildren or, or sisters and brothers. I think it's all contextual. But it's very important that we train them when they were young because they would not depart from it. My name is Olivia and I'm a PhD student at the School of Public Health and I think my question is probably pertinent to all of today's panelists and I was just wondering what advice you might have to prevent physical and mental fatigue when con confronting violence and promoting change in your work, whether that be as a lawyer, activist, practitioner, etc. I always say one of the ways that I deal with sort of the stress of racism and patriarchy is by exercising every day. So that's one, one thing I do. Self-care is pretty much the number one thing I think about at all times, not only you know maintaining a close relationship with a therapist, um, but also just making sure that I am taking care of myself first because you can't do this work if you're not um, taking care of yourself because it's very emotionally taxing. Um, and you know, Laura can attest to this sort of, you can't even go on the internet or on your Twitter feed um, most days because it's, it's so ugly, um, particularly if you're writing something or something's in the news like Rolling Stone and UVA has been uh, this week. So I think self-care for me is uh, a number, a really high priority um, because I feel like you can't do the work unless you're taking care of yourself first. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I think there are some fantastic feminist blogs about self-care techniques and you have to find the thing that works for you and it isn't the same for everyone. Um, I think that's so important. So often you will see people telling, trying to tell you how to do it. Mm -hmm. And especially with that kind of abuse and that stuff, you so often hear people saying, well, just take a break from Twitter or, you know, turn off the internet. Right. Why are you on there? Um, or, or people will often say things like, don't feed the trolls, right? We've all heard that phrase. It's a way of kind of blaming you for what's happening. Yeah. And I just think it's so important to find what works for you in these scenarios because actually there are women who think it makes them feel better if they retweet what's happening or they put it out publicly. There's an MP in the UK called Stella Creasy who was in the House of Parliament and someone was tweeting her while she was doing her job asking to see her pussy. So she got her supporters, her thousands of Twitter followers, to bombard this guy with pictures of kittens. <laughs> And at the end of the day, he came back saying, I get it, okay, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Can you please just stop the kittens? <laughs> you know, or um, I heard another great story from a journalist called Helen Lewis about a blog that she follows where there was horrible vitriolic abuse being put in the comments. And the blogger chose to publish the comments to keep the name the same, but she would just edit them before they appeared to say, I really love your blog and I'm just so feminist. And this person would write back saying, that's not what I said, you know, so people have their own coping mechanisms and I think finding what works for you and feeling free to do that is important but most of all having a network of support within women who are doing similar work. Um, having family and friends who are supportive is absolutely wonderful but for me the number one thing that keeps me going is being closely in touch with other women who are in the same situation, who can relate, who can support you, who know when to just listen and when to make a joke out of it and there are a lot of of online organizations I think on social media where you can find that kind of support and other women in the feminist community will reach out to you and those connections for me are invaluable. I'm Steve Luz Halterman from Tufts University. Yay. I have a question about language, meaning and power with respect to a, a particular contemporary usage that I find troubling and regressive and I hope doesn't sound trivial but it's the phrase, you guys. And how this phrase is seeping into uh, discourse, uh, I thought initially with younger people, but I hear it from my same aged colleagues now in meetings. I hear it from young women students referring to groups of women students in a room. And I'm baffled by this, and I just wonder, what does it mean? And what is it saying about gendered power as it's used in contemporary contexts. Thanks. Thank you. Just, just a, qu a quick reference. My uh, colleague Cheryl Kleinman at the University of North Carolina has written about this very question for about 15 years now. It's hard to get traction in the mainstream conversation about such kind of linguistic critiques, but she has written about it, Cheryl Kleinman. Can I also say, it just made me think of another linguistic usage that I think would be useful to bring up, is the word accuser in, in rape cases or sexual abuse cases or domestic violence cases is a horribly regressive linguistic turn to call the person, the complaining witness or the, the victim or the alleged victim, if you will, calling them an accuser turns around the, the, the public is identi the public is positioned to identify sympathetically with victims in a general sense. I know victim blaming gets in the way of people's identification with victims in some cases, but generally speaking, when we hear about victimization, we, vic we say, that's horrible, that's what we really wish that didn't happen, maybe that could have happened to me or someone I love. But when you call the victim the accuser, you reverse that process because now she and he is no longer the victim that we're sympathetic with. She or he is now the accuser. She's doing something to him, yep. she's accusing him, mm -hmm. and we're positioned to sympathetically identify with him as the victim of her accusation right. rather than her as the victim of his alleged perpetration. Right. So in one word turn, we've shifted our identification and support from the victim to the alleged perpetrator. And it's a mainstream usage. If you do a Google yep. uh, search on the word accuser, it comes up hundreds of thousands and hundreds of thousands because it's now completely conventional to use the word accuser. I think it's a horrible development. And, a, and, a, and it's talk about, talk about stepping backwards. We've made lots of progress in the sexual assault movement, but the word accuser is another reason why victims don't come forward. Mm -hmm. Because now she or he is gonna be, she, why are you accusing him? Why are you doing this to him? Rather than, wow, we really feel bad that something happened to you and what can we do to help you? 
Hello, my name is Elizabeth Steiner Milligan. I'm from Maynard, Massachusetts. I'd like to speak with the ex. I'm sort of addressing my question to the ex football player who dab dabbles in media. And <laughs> I was thinking today, and when you talk, I've heard about leadership and power. And I'm thinking, well, here we are in Cambridge, Radcliffe and Harvard. Let's see, when I was working in an international something company in Houston, I, we sent a lot of people up to Harvard for executive management. Um, don't you think that's something that Harvard could incorporate into that thing so that they would go back? Something about training, thinking about linguistics. If you put it in terms of it's power, that makes it sexy. And well, those guys are up there for power. I mean, and just sort of, and then if Harvard does it, the country will follow, but they won't, that's my thought. So what do you think? And, and if Dean Cohn wants to chime in. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. The, the, again, I say quick and I'll try to be quick. I think that every, if people say to me, what would you do on a college campus if you had the power to, do, to enact your vision on, the, on that college campus, whether it's Harvard or any other school? And the first thing I say is I would get the most powerful people in that university or that college in a room and have a training for them on these issues, period, end of sentence. That's the first thing I would do. Not, because, and, and, and that means men and women, but the goal is to get the powerful men in that room. Because lots of men at Harvard and everywhere else have enormous institutional power and authority. Yet, And there's some of them good men doing, making good decisions, but a lot of them don't have any background in training. When I say training, I mean training. I mean intensive leadership training on this subject matter. And lots of powerful men and women don't have that kind of training, and yet they have the power. So I, yes, I would think it would be great if Harvard had, had mandated training from the president on down, all the deans. And I say training, meaning like real training. Again, not attending a one hour presentation or do some online work. I'm t and I'm not talking about lawyers telling them what their risk management people are saying about, you know, <laughs> about you have to follow this policy because of the federal mandates. I'm talking about true leadership training. And I also still think that's true in the, you know, the US military with the, with the most powerful. If, if I had my druthers, if you will, it wouldn't be training 18-year-old new Marines or airmen or, or, or sailors or, uh, uh, or soldiers. It would be training the President of the United States, training the, the Vice President of the United States, training the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I say training. These people, again, a lot of them, most of them are good people, but they haven't had the training. So yes, I think Harvard could be incredibly um, uh, a leader in all of this. At Harvard Business School, I'm going to be going there in the fall. So Harvard Business School, this should be mandated training in Harvard Business School uh, for, for all the faculty as well. I mean, I know it's complicated by, you know, collective bargaining agreements and all kinds of other complications when you're dealing with faculties at universities, but there's a lot of unused power here at Harvard on these very same subjects. And these women here, these Harvard women here and Radcliffe women here are, are doing what they can with their, with their influence, which is a great thing. But there's a lot of people who are not in this room who are powerful yeah. men at Harvard. And don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name is Jessica Levy. I'm a student at the college here. Um, one thing you, Ms. Bates, talked about was that the initial response you got um, when you tried to start the project was, oh, sexism doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I think that thanks to you and thanks to the efforts of a lot of people, there's an increasing number of people who do acknowledge the presence that it has. Um, but one thing that I've noticed that comes with this is that there's also an increasing number of people who say, oh, of course these issues exist, but that's not me. And they separate themselves out and say, and those issues and talking about those, those movements are so polarizing to me. Yeah. And I'm not sure if uh, this, or also I'm sure uh, Mr. Katz, you have comments on this because you talked a lot about responsibility and how we incorporate that. Um, but what do you think is the proper response? How do we break through this defensive metric to get to a better understanding? Do you want to go first? Just a quick question. What would you say to a white person, you, just because you're not, a, you know, you're not burning crosses in your front yard, that you have no responsibility to work against racism? If you're a heterosexual person, just because you're not going out and beating up gay people, that you don't have a responsibility to work against heterosexism? It's a bad argument. So if people at Harvard who will respect good arguments, tell them they're making a bad argument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. That's good. Yeah. I, also, I think sometimes 
it's helpful to just write it out because when approaching these questions for the first time, it is so, as you said, becoming incredibly common for there to be a knee-jerk defensive response. And I think it comes from the misconception that if we're talking about women, if we're talking about sexism, we must be saying that all men are sexist and that it's somehow an attack on them. And I think that can lead to that initial kind of defensive response, but that actually, as you keep talking and as you explain the issues that we're actually talking about and the fact that we're just asking everybody to stand up we make it clear that this isn't about men against women, it's about people standing up to prejudice, that people do start to recognise that actually it isn't a kind of conversation that's persecuting them. Um, and I think it just has to be about reiterating that, really. And I do feel sort of quite hopeful and confident that we are seeing those conversations start to happen. And I think sometimes it can be about flipping the script and getting people to consider something from a different perspective. So um, an example that comes to mind is that I was working in a school recently and I don't know how many people are aware of the Lad Bible. Is that something people know? It's a kind of online website that's very much about being a lad and banter and it's quite sexist and it's all about kind of sports culture and traditional tropes of masculinity, you could say. And they have a Twitter account which has a thing called Cleavage Thursday where they um, ask girls to send pictures of, well, it, the name sort of does what it says on the tin, really. Um, and then they tweet them out. And I was in a school and I was trying to talk to the boys about this and they were very defensive. They reacted just as you described, you know, well, you know, this isn't anything to do with us and you know, those women choose to do it, so what's the problem? You know, no one's forcing them, it's not that big a deal, it's just a joke. And I just said to them, how can you imagine, tell me, how do you think you would feel um, about it if you were a girl? And they all went completely quiet. So sometimes I think it's about getting people to look at things in a different way, which perhaps doesn't center on them and taking them out of that instinct. Hi, my name is Justine Egan, I'm a PhD student at URI um, in psychology, and so my question is really broad, so I'm going to try to narrow it. Um, Laura mentioned earlier that we live in these bubbles of violence and that, you know, we talk about domestic violence, then we talk about sexual assault, we talk about gender violence, we talk about racism. How do we really acknowledge these intersecting identities? Um, because we're not all, you know, we're not just one identity. We're multiple, um, many, many identities. And how do we acknowledge these power shifts and how do we acknowledge these differences in identity when we're thinking about how to reach to others and this global approach? Um, Jackson, you had mentioned, you know, this human rights. Um, if you mention it as human rights, no one's going to hear it. Men aren't going to hear it. And, but then at the same time, how do we get them to the table? And I, I, I think that's my question. Of, I went to a diversity conference at my university a few weeks ago. Um, it was a student-led conference, and the majority of those who attended were persons of color. Yep. Um, and that was frustrating. Yeah. Um, I look around this room, and a majority are women. How do we get them to the table? And yeah, <laughs> that's my question, I guess. I mean, I, th I think part of it is, uh, you know, if you call a diversity conference, <laughs> that's, that's I mean, white people are probably not going to think that that's yeah. about them, you know, like Jackson's work in talking about language. I mean, maybe if uh, more conferences, you know, were called like manhood conference or like how to be a good bro or I don't know, but <laughs> it, it, it would, I, I think, I just, I mean, I just think that, you know, a lot of my work is, is tr learning how to frame messaging so that men can hear me. Um, and, I, and I actually do know that, you know, just a function of my gender and my race, sometimes some men are not going to hear what I'm saying, regardless of what it is. But, um, you know, trying to, to tailor uh, sort of how we're framing things so that people are actually hearing you, no matter what identity you're, you're speaking and position you're speaking from. Um, so yeah, maybe, you know, the next conference will be like confronting manhood or like how to be a better bro um, so that we can uh, get more men to attend. Well, uh, also, I appreciate the creativity, but yeah. honestly, I think, I think we, need to be, we need to be clear that these are yeah. leadership issues and yeah. if you're in a position of leadership, we expect you to go to these kind of trainings, not yeah. because you're a nice person, right. not nice white person, nice man. So for example, on college campuses, one of the things that I've been doing increasingly and, and getting more momentum because, you know, We've been saying some of this for years, but now the momentum is on our side a little bit more. Is, for example, in the all Greek letter organizations in, on a campus, if you're going to be an officer in a, in a fraternity or a sorority, you have to go through mandated training, not just attending one mm -hmm. talk, one right. 
talk in a room full of 350 people and then say, okay, we did our sexual assault training for the semester or for the year, but you have to be trained. You're a leader and you have to be trained. If you're a student athlete and you're a captain of the sport of your team or a co-captain or if you're a, on the student athlete council, in other words, if you're in a formal position of leadership, you need to be trained. Minimum one day trainings I'm talking about here, not, not one hour or two hours, one full day of training. If you're a, um, an RA, of course, resident assistant, you're already a leader, you, you get training. I mean, RAs are already have a regimen of training, but this needs to be part of that training. If you think about this concept at every level in our yeah. society, you want to be a coach. If you, if, for example, you want to be a, a high school coach, sports coach of some, some sport. Imagine if it was mandated that everybody who's going to be a coach in, in high school has to go through training on sexual assault prevention, relationship abuse prevention, and the role of the coach. Not because, again, you're a nice person wanting to go to a conference, but because you're a coach. And if you don't do it, then you don't, can't be a coach, period. Yeah. This is what we expect yeah. of our coaches. Right. And if, if that was the case in every institutional context that you can think of, imagine, by the way, in grad schools of education, which I went to you know, here at HDSE and, uh, and at UCLA, imagine if it were you were required to get a master's degree in, in whatever field within education, certainly secondary ed administration, or you're gonna get a PhD in education or an EDD in education, you're mandated Part of your training is sexual assault prevention, relationship abuse prevention, combining some of the best theory and, and, and knowledge that we, we have for decades. By the way, we have decades of research that shows the impact of sexual violence in the home, domestic violence in the home, and bad educational outcomes, right? We don't have to make this up. We have the decades of research. But it was, it was now said it's, it's imperative that you get this training, not because you took an elective course that happens to deal with it, but because we don't think we're going to credential educators to go out and to be educational administrators without this training, without this knowledge. That's an institutional response rather than hoping people will show up at a, at a conference or a, or a voluntary association. By the way, if you want a bumper sticker for what I just said and it's related to what I was saying earlier, there's no peace on the streets if there's no peace at home. Yeah. There's no peace in the community if there's no peace in the family. There's no peace in school if there's no peace at home. There's the connections between what happens in, in, this, in this sort of private realm versus what happens in the public realm need to be explicit. Feminists have been saying this for decades and decades and decades, but now we have the opportunity to actually make it happen in terms of the kind of training mandates that we, we should be putting into place. Hi, thank you all. My name is Risa Mednick. Sorry, my voice is going. I'm the director of Transition House, which is Cambridge's domestic violence agency. Um, we've been around for going on 40 years, one of the oldest in the country. And I wanna share some observations from the field. Change and culture change, um, as you've all noted, is desperately constrained by the limits of language, um, by our inability to also pose a vision of what an alternative looks like. I think it's very, very hard to engage meaningfully um, both with men, with boys, with people in power in general, as you've all spoke to, without the true vision of what we want to see and how we need to get there. And I see this every day with our clients and in the relationships they have. Um, we've pioneered um, intervention, dating violence intervention over 30 years ago. And just this week, I had a conversation with a high school principal who said, yeah, it's really not cost effective for us to, to invest in prevention education broadly. We think it's better just to do some intervention work with the highest risk kids. I flipped that script and said, you know, that's really short-sighted and cited the evidence of why that's so short-sighted. But that's a, a case in point in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 2015 of how both regressive our tactics are, our policies are, and how reified they are throughout our communities. So I think we have to engage much more proactively with not just, you know, small tweaks in our language, but a true re visioning process here. Um, and the other thing that can't be overlooked as well, and I think you know, we've, we've skirted around this issue, are, you know, kind of the, the noble triumvirate intersection of capitalism, violence, and oppression. So thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Next uh, question. Hello, um, my name is Ivy Burns. I'm from the University of Rhode Island. I'm a student leader as a peer educator and also as a uh, gender equity group on campus. And one of the topics that we uh, have, comes up over and over again is street harassment mm -hmm. and catcalling. And I know personally that 
before the first time I ever experienced street harassment, I thought, oh yeah, I'll have a sassy comment, it'll be ready, it'll happen, but the first time it happened to me, I froze. Mm -hmm. And the second time it happened to me, I froze. And the third time it happened to me, I froze. And I really hope there's no next time. But I get asked again and again and again, what are effective strategies to combat this direct form of sexism? So that's my first question. Uh, what do you think is the best way to combat this in a quick and effective way? And if you believe that this quick and instantaneous connection between two strangers can make an impact. Yeah, no, I, I actually, street harassment is one of the things, I mean, I essentially call it the everyday manifestation of rape culture, and it is on the spectrum, right? It's, it's when you go outside to go to work every day and you are objectified with every step that you take, and, and that's why, you know, a phrase like resting bitch face exists, right? I'm sorry I cursed, but resting, I mean, that, that phrase exists because of the fact that women have to sort of have no smile and no expression, looking straight down with their headphones in so that they don't look like they're available to men. Um, and they don't make eye contact so that, you know, you don't, because you don't want to continue that conversation with a stranger. Um, I mean, I don't know the correct answer on how to deal with street harassment because it's different for everyone and it all depends upon how safe you feel in that moment. If I'm in a place where there are other people in close proximity and I feel like I'm not physically in danger, I talk back. I mean, I, I have a lot of like witty responses and um, you know, I use the word patriarchy a lot because generally street harassers have no idea what that word means. Um, uh, or you know, I, I, I sometimes will, if, I'm, if I know I'm gonna be walking sort of through my neighborhood, I'll wear a shirt. I have a shirt that says like, I believe in Ada Hill and I always find it funny when people harass me when I'm wearing that shirt um, in particular because <laughs> I'm like, mm, you know. But, but I think that it's all depending upon how you feel physically. If you feel safe in that moment, I think it is okay to say, you know what, it is not appropriate for you to say that to me. I'm on my way to work and I don't know you and it, you're objectifying me or say how it makes you feel. Um, but that's only if you feel physically safe because obviously um, saying something and ignoring can both lead to you know, being followed for blocks. I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen sort of the viral video um, with the woman walking through New York City. That video, while you know, I think sh could have shown more a diverse array of men sort of doing the harassing, that is exactly what it's like to walk around in New York City as a woman or in another large uh, me metropolis. And so I think that if you feel physically safe, I think it is appropriate to say something back um, and to tell and to shame that person um, for that behavior, but I also think that it's really important for m the man standing next to him mm -hmm. to say something mm -hmm. as well, because it, it shouldn't be on me to, to stop the behavior, um, because I'm not the one perpetrating the behavior. Um, I'm the victim, I'm the, I'm the person receiving the harassment. So it's not your responsibility, but if you feel physically safe, I do say something back. Um, and also, on, uh, I believe Hollaback's website has um, a different strategies on, way you, on ways in which you can respond. Um, those include sort of cards you can hand to the man <laughs> explaining why his behavior is inappropriate. Um, but that's all again goes back to if you feel physically safe because that is the number one um, priority in that moment. Yeah, I agree that you'd never want to kind of mandate any given response because the point is it shouldn't be happening in the first right. place. And <laughs> as someone mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes that response to freezing is something that you don't have any control over. And I would never want someone to feel that they were at fault because they didn't respond. But I think it's really helpful to know that there are different types of response, that it doesn't have to be about a confrontation. So we've had some fantastic um, results from people writing in saying that they were harassed by someone who was either in a van, in a truck, on a construction site and that rather than engage in the moment of confrontation they actually rang the company and reported it later and had a really good response mm -hmm. so I think it's really great to know that you can do that we've also had some brilliant examples from women writing in and sharing their responses which others have said have been really helpful later on when they've experienced it um, like there was a woman who was on the subway and a guy um, put his hand on her so she grabbed his hand held it up in the air it was a really packed carriage and she just said has anyone lost a hand because I found this one on my ass. Um, there was another woman who was on the train and the guy next to her, she just said, could you move your bag so I could sit down? And he said, why didn't you grab my... And she just said very loudly to the whole carriage, I'm really sorry I didn't bring any tweezers. Um, or my favorite one of all time was a woman who had big breasts and she said she was constantly catcalled by people who would just shout big breasts at her basically, big tits, big boobs, whatever. So in the end she just started looking down at them and screaming like she'd never seen them before. <laughs>
Those are some ideas, anyway. Good. I, like I want to thank our panel. You guys have been fantastic, as witnessed by the passion and the number of questions. And I want to thank all of our panelists today. As I was listening throughout the day, I've been writing down verbs because I think it's, we're talking about action here. And I also want to thank you, the audience, because there are many activists among you, and it's important that you're here. So here are some of the verbs I've been writing down. You are going to recognize yourself in these. Speaking, listening, supporting, naming, standing up, provoking, organizing, blogging, tweeting, challenging, writing, making films, training, analyzing, engaging, disrupting, monitoring, disseminating, teaching, leading, demanding, intimidating, <laughs> confronting. Thank you very much. And I just want to add my thanks to all the panelists. It's been a fabulous day. To the organizers of the conference, to our wonderful staff who put this day together, and to you, the audience, who've been a great audience. And I hope this is just the beginning of the conversation. Thank you.